I know you are surprised that I ask you not to watch. Yes, psychologically, when you ask someone not to do something, they tend to do it. And I'm trying to verify if that theory is actually true. Okay, now that you watch the video, even when I ask you not to watch, let me know at the comment section the reason why you do if you are less busy. So we are here together now to learn what electricity and we are going to take it from the scratch to the peak. Thank you. There's no way we are going to talk about electricity that we are not going to be talking about what? Electric charge. And when you talk about electric charge, we also need to talk about what? An atom. So when you talk about an atom, an atom is made up of what? The three subatomic particles, the proton, the neutron, and the electron. So when you talk about what the proton in terms of mass, proton has more mass compared to what electron, but approximately the same with that of neutron. That is, neutron is having approximately the same what, the same size with that of what, proton. Okay, if we understand that now, we are not actually looking after their mass in this video. What we are about to talk is what, their charge. The charge on proton is positive, and that's why we say proton is positively charged, and the charge on neutron is zero. That is, it is electrically what? Neutral. And when you talk about electron, the charge on electron is negative. That shows that we only have two types of charges, positive charge and what? Negative charge. Having to understand this now, we can now proceed to the next thing. What is the unit of charge? The unit of charge is the coulomb. The coulomb is the unit of charge. And the, a positive charge of proton is 1.6 times 10 raised to power minus 19 coulomb. Likewise, that of electron, it is negative 1.6 times 10 raised to power minus 19 coulomb. And these are the smallest possible charge that we can find in the universe. I'll try to explain something regarding this. Any other size of charge that you are going to have is said to be multiple of what? Of 1.6 times 10 raised to power minus 19. If it is going to be a negative charge, it's going to be what? Multiplied by negative 1.6 times 10 raised to power minus 19. That's that about that. That is, the smallest charge that you can ever have in this universe is what is 1.6 times 10 raised to power minus 19 coulomb. Any other charge that you are going to have is going to be multiple of this. And what can we deduce from that? Yes, we can deduce that what charge are quantized. Do we understand that now? So charge are what quantized. So can we go on now? Good. Yes, we can. Yes. Now let's quickly look at that. When you talk about these three particles, where is their position in the nucleus? Before we go on, what is the nucleus? The nucleus is the dense mass of an atom. The dense mass of an atom is what we regard as what? As the nucleus. And uh, if I have an atomic structure like this, now this is what? This particular region is the nucleus. And it's made up of what? The proton and the what? Neutron. So around the nucleus, there is an orbit that an electron is revolving on, and that is what this particular point here. So here is what here is electron that can freely move apart. Why what we have proton and what and neutron at the nucleus. So if the nucleus is what is the dense mass of an atom. You can easily know that what really determines the mass of an atom is proton and neutron. Is that taken now? Good. If that should be the case, the number of proton and the number of electron in what in an atom is the same thing. Now that the number of proton and the number of electron in an atom is the same thing, that simply means that everything in the universe that consists of an atom, they are electrically neutral except if they are charged. Are we together now? Okay, we are tends to understand a lot of things in this class. Get it clear now. 
If the number of proton and the number of electron in an atom is the same thing, then an atom is electrically what? Neutral. And you know that everything in the universe, they consist of what? An atom. Definitely, body are cells to be electrically neutral until they are charged. Is that it now? And that's let us understand when we talk about what? Energy. When you talk about energy in the universe, the energy can be transferred from one point to another, but it will still remain what? The same. That is what? The algebraic sum of the energy in the universe is equal to zero. Likewise, that of charge as well. So, charge also can be what? Moving from one point to another because you cannot create charge and you cannot do what? You cannot generate what? Charge. Charge cannot be what? Cannot be created and at the same time it cannot be what? Destroyed. But we can acquire charge because it can move from one point to another. Now, since charge can be what? Acquired, but it cannot be destroyed or created, then charge also needs to be conserved. So, if that should be the case, now that we have understand proton, neutron, electron, and we have understand nucleus, including their what? Position. Then we can now discuss the law of conservation of charge. When you talk about the law of conservation of charge, whenever electric charge transfer out of a system, whenever an electric charge transfers out of a system, that same charge must be gained by the surrounding. That is, if you have a system, an electric charge what transfer out of that system is going somewhere and where is the place is going to the surrounding. The number of charge that is left from the system is equivalent to the number of charge that the surrounding tend to what? To gain. Is that it now? Okay, if that should be the case, we can say the net amount of charge produced in any process must always be what? Zero. And that is what the law of conservation of charge states. That is, net amount of charge produced in any what? Processes. What? Must always be what? Zero. Do we understand that now? So that is what, what the law of conservation of charge is trying to let us know. Now let us talk about what charging a body. When you talk about charging a body, charging is a process by which what a system gains or lose a certain what quantity of electron. So let's look at something here now. So remember that we cannot create charge, but a charge can be acquired, isn't it? So when you talk about charging, when you say you charge something, charging simply means a situation whereby what? A body gain what? Electron or it lose what? Electron. And you're not sure, you can say when a body gain what? Charge or lose charge. Okay, let's quickly look into that. <clears throat> if I rub silk and what? Glass rub together, silk plus glass rod, you know, this is said to give us what? A positive what? Positive charge. Positive charge. That is, the glass rod will become positively what? Charge. Whenever you rub what? Silk and glass rod together, the glass rod become positively charged. But because we said what? Charge is not created nor what destroyed but it is acquired immediately what glass rod acquired what positive charge by induced the silk will become what negatively charged are we together okay the next one is when i rub what a plastic comb okay plastic comb with clothes what happened the plastic comb will become what negative what negative charge that is the plastic comb will become negatively charged why the clothes will become what positively what positively charged are we together now and if i rub what ebonite rod ebonite rod with four what i'm going to have is that the ebonite rod will become what negative what negative charge why the four will become positively charged are we together now how do we know the kind of charge that is going to be produced by all this body? Good. It's a nice question to ask. Silk plus glass rod give us positive charge. How do we know that the glass is what become positive and the silk is what become negative? 
Okay, according to Benjamin Franklin, he says the body that gets altered that is surrounded by what the highest number of fire is the positive charge. And you will see when you rub glass rod and silk together, the glass rod tends to be altered than the silk, and that's why we say the glass, glass rod is the positively charged Why what silk is the negative. The same thing goes to the plastic and the comb. When you rub comb and what clothes together, the cloth tends to be altered than what the plastic, and that's why we say the cloth becomes positively charged. Why the plastic comb becomes what negatively charged. All of these are by convention. This is what they tell us that it is, and we just take it like that. Is that it? You know? So when I say convention, it means that is what they've generally accepted, and that is what we are using. Is that it? You know? So that's just about that. What will now happen if I had what a glass rod, a glass rod with four together, there will be no charge, no charge. So if I had what silk and what ebonite rod together, the same thing will happen. Silk and what ebonite rod, there won't be what? There won't be charge. Why? Because the atomic what atomic theory of charge acquisition states that what <coughs> charge cannot be created nor destroyed, but it can be what? It can be acquired when the excess electron in a what donor atom transfers to the acceptor what acceptor atom so when there is no excess electron if you keep rubbing from now till tomorrow it yields nothing is that taking now so when there is excess electron somewhere that is when what the charge acquisition will take place do we understand that now okay so that's that about that now the next thing we need to understand is what the difference between conductor and the insulator So, conductor and the insulator. What is a conductor and what is an insulator? This is very simple concepts to understand. When you talk about what conductor, literally we said what well, those are the materials that, are, uh, that allow the flow of what? Electron. And when you talk about insulator, those material that doesn't allow what insulator so any material that do was that has a free electron that is the electron in it are not what tightly fixed that is they are free to move around we regard them as what as a conductor example is what a metal a metal is a good conductor because what the electron in it are free to move around they transfer what they move from they keep on moving, the continuous movement of what, of an electron or what we call charge is what we refer to as electricity. So any material that, are, that can conduct electricity, they are said to be what, a conductor. But when you talk about what, insulator, insulator has what, a fixed electron. That is the electron in them are permanently what, fixed. They are unable to move around. A good example of an insulator like that is wood, plastic and the likes. Do we understand that now? And we can easily see that using the band theory of what? Of charge. When you talk about the band theory, our band theory states that when you talk about what? A solid. A solid has what? Three bands. The conduction what? The conduction band. Well, look, let me start by saying the valency band, the forbidden band, and the conduction band. These are the three what? Three faces of a solid. Now, for what? For a conductor. A conductor, but before I go there, mind you, this forbidden band, no electron must fall inside. Are we together? Now, if I have what? If I have a conductor, for a conductor, the forbidden band is very, very shrink. That is, the forbidden band is shrink. We just have the valency band and the conduction band. And the valency band is partially what? Filled with electrons. So by the time you apply it to this, those electrons, they become energetic and they tend to cross what? The forbidden band and jump into the what? Conduction band. Because they are able to move from what? From this point to this point. That enables the material to conduct electricity and we regard that material as a conductor. Do we understand that? Okay. But for an insulator, we have what? The forbidden band to be very, very wide. Are we together? And what the electron in the valency band are fixed, then the conduction band is empty. 
By the time you apply heat to this work substance, for the electron to move, when they become energetic, instead of them to move to the conduction band, they fall into the what forbidden band. Hence, this material will not be able to conduct electricity. Do we understand that now? Okay, that's that about conductor and what insulator. Okay, now when we now talk about what charging a body, how can we charge a neutral body? I will be talking about two methods of charging a neutral body, and that will be the induced method and the induction method. Okay? Induced. Induced. Induced charge. And uh, induction. <coughs> so, we are going to be explaining this now. I will start by explaining what's the induced charge. Now, let's see. If I have figure A and uh, figure B. Now, let's say this is what? A neutral body. This body is electrically what? Neutral. And I have this other body to be positively charged at this end and also positively charged at this end. Are we together now? So, this is what? A positively, <coughs> a positively charged body. Are we together now? Okay. So, this is a neutral body. Note that. And this is what? A positively charged body. We are to explain what we regard as what? What we regard as induced. Now, Suppose that I bring this body and this one together such that I'm having something like this. So if I bring them together, what happens is that this place becomes negatively charged and here remain positively charged and here would also be positively what? Positively charged. Okay, this is because what the excess electron in this point has moved down to what to this place, leaving what positive charge be behind. You know, when you say a body is positively charged, it means what the body is what is having a deficiency in electron. Where there is deficiency in electron and there is excess of what proton, then we say that body is positively charged. And when there is excess of what electron, we say that body is negatively what charged. So by induct, by induce rather, when we bring these two bodies together, the excess electron at these ends move to these ends. Are you getting this now? Leaving what proton that is positively charged behind. Do we get this now? So this is that about what about that. So that is this end tends to gain what ele electron, and this end tends to what gain product uh, proton rather. Is that taking us? So when you charge a body by induced, so that particular ends gets what a charge that is opposite to what to what you have there before. That is, if I have here to be negative, if here is what negative, and I bring them closer, this place will become positively what positively charged. Why here will become what? So if here is negatively charged, if if this side is negatively charged, and I bring it closer to this place. This place will become negatively charged, while here will remain what? Positive. Are we together now? So, you can see here is positive now, and what? This place become what? Positively charged. Then here becomes what? Negative. Is that taking now? So, induced charge, when you induce charge, that body that you charge, get exact what? Exact charge that is on that body that you are using to charge it. Then the opposite becomes what? The charge on that ends. Is that taking now? So, let's go to the next one, which is by what? Induction and what grounding. When you talk about induction and grounding, what are we simply talking about? Let's quickly look into that. Induction and grounding. I would like you to understand this quite well. Induction. So charging by induction. Okay, guys, now let's look at this now. Let's look at a neutral rod. If I have a neutral rod like this, and this is what 
So this is a metal that acts as a conductor. Okay? And here, the ground acts as a septum of electron. This is electron, conductor of electron. Okay? And I have another body. Okay, let me use another color for that. So this is positive. And this is a negative rod. <clears throat> Okay, so watch guys, <clears throat> let's quickly understand this, when you talk about induction and grounding, here is another way of charging a neutral body, you know, the first time we have already explained how to charge a neutral body by induced charge, so when you talk about that, we said, when I have what, a neutral body like this now, and uh, <clears throat> this is a neutral body, and I have what, a body that is positively charged like this, there's positive charge here, there's positive charge here, when I bring the two bodies together, the excess electron at this end tends to move to this place. Why this place will become positively charged and this place will become more negatively charged. Now, if this place is negatively charged before and uh, this body is a neutral body, when I bring them closer together, the electron in this place tends to move down to this place out there and this place will be left with what? Proton. Why is proton not moving? Why electron? Because what? Proton is fixed inside what inside the nucleus it's not like it's not moving we explain that when we are explaining what electricity because when you talk about electricity we have two type i will together now so we talk about that when we get there okay so let's back to class now we have explained induced then we're about to explain what induction when you talk about induction this is a neutral body and i want to charge you what this neutral body by induction now, there will be a wire connected to what? To this neutral body that is buried to the ground. Now, this wire is known as conductor of electron. And what? This ground is known as what? The acceptor of electron. How does this work? Now, if I bring what? A negatively charged rod closer to this rod, to this <coughs> neutral body. Remember, it's not touching it unlike that of induced. Now, if I bring this negatively charged rod closer to this what, neutral body, what will happen is that it becomes what, positively charged. Why? Because the electron in this particular body is said to be repelled by this one. So when electron and electron do what, repel, the repulsion is what makes all this electron get conducted by what? By this wire. So as they get conducted by this wire, they will all be accepted by the ground leaving this body positively charged. Are we together now? That is, when you bring this negative charge closer to this body, the electron here is said to repel the one here, causing it to move through the wire because the wire is a conductor of electron. So the wire said to do what? To conduct the electron out of this rod, out of this rod, leaving it what? Positively charged. So then the electron is said to do what? To sink into the ground because what? The ground is what is is a sector of what of electron. Now, if I want this body to be permanently what permanently positively charged, what I will do is to cut off this wire. When I cut off the wire, I will have this. So when I cut off the wire, that will leave this body positively what positively charged. Are we together? So, that is that about what? Induction and what? And grounding. Okay? So, let's quickly move to the next part of the class, which is what? Coulomb's law.
Coulomb's law. When you talk about Coulomb's law, Coulomb's law is talking about point charges. Not just point charges, but a point charge that is at rest. A stationary point charge. Coulomb's law is not applicable to a moving charge. Are we together? When you talk about Coulomb's law, Coulomb's law is applicable to what? To point charges. It's not applicable to what? To a moving charge. Mind you, the point charge must be at rest. That is stationary. Are we together? Okay, if we have, let's quickly look at what the law states. If I have what? A charge Q1. And I have uh, another charge Q2. Like this. Just like the gravitational field, whereby if I have mass M1 and what mass M2, there is a force of attraction between their two. Likewise, if I have two points charge, there is a force of attraction between their two or a force of repulsion. Now, if this charge is not the same thing as this, probably this is what positive and this is negative, or this is negative and this is positive, there will be what a force of attraction between these two bodies. Are we together now? So let's say the force of attraction on this is what is F12. And the force of attraction on this is F21. This means that this is the force that takes this one to attract what? That takes this body Q2 to attract Q1. And this is the force that takes what Q1 to attract what? Q2. Are we together? Now, Coulomb's law is what explains this what? The characteristics of this force. What does Coulomb's law state? Coulomb's law states that giving two point charges, the force that is between them is directly proportional to the product of their magnitude and inversely proportional to the square of their distance apart. So, if the distance between what Q1 and Q2 is R, are we together now? The magnitude of Q1 is known to be positive and the magnitude of Q2 is known to be negative or vice versa then that would be what? A force of attraction. But if this is positive and this one is also positive, that would be a, point, a force of repulsion. If this is negative and this is negative, that will also be what? Force of repulsion. Because the law of what? Electrostatic states that like charge do what? Like charge repel or like charge does what? Attract. Do we understand that now? Okay, <clears throat> let's quickly go back to the Coulomb's law. So if you have to state the law now, we can now say what? Well, Coulomb's law states that the force of attraction or repulsion between two point charges is directly proportional to the product of their magnitude and inversely proportional to the square of their distance apart. Let's quickly look into that. From the first statement, F is proportional to Q1 and what? Q2. And the second statement says F is proportional to the square of their distance apart. If this is equation 1 and this is what? Equation 2. This is a joint variation. So we have that F is proportional to Q1, Q2 over R square. Are we together? So if I remove this proportionality sign, there is need to introduce what? A constant. So I have that F is equal to KQ1, Q2 over what? R square. This is what? This is Coulomb's law. And this Coulomb's law, this particular force that equal KQ1, Q2 over R square is the force that exists between these two what? Two charges. Remember, charge Q what? Q1 attract charge Q2 by a force F1, 2. Then charge Q2 attract what? Q1 by a force what? F2, 1. Now, remember, this is a vector quantity. As this one is a vector quantity that we can say from the third law of motion, Action and reaction are what equal but opposite. Are we together? So if action and what reactions are equal but opposite, then we can say F12 is negative what? F21. So do we got this now? F12 is equal what? Negative what? F21. And this is equal to what? KQ1, Q2 over what? Arrow square. 
this negative sign simply what shows that they are in opposite direction so this one is attracting towards this and this one is attracting towards this so their direction is opposite but they are actually what equal in magnitude which is what this that is given by coulomb's law so are we together now if we have understand this there is what an attribute to this k this k is always attributed to what to epsilon which we regard to this is epsilon naught this is called the permittivity permittivity of a vacuum so when you talk about the permittivity of vacuum we have it to be epsilon so the value of k is given to be 8 point okay 8.99 times 10 raised to power 9 approximately this is what newton meter square per coulomb square okay if this should be the case k is approximately 9 times 10 raised to power 9 newton meter square per coulomb square do we get this now and the value for k can be gotten by saying 1 all over 4 pi epsilon naught 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught where the value of epsilon naught which is the permittivity of vacuum is 8.85 times 10 raised to power of minus 12 times 10 raised to power minus 12 so that is going to give us what coulomb square per newton meter square are we together now so this is the value for epsilon naught 8.85 times 10 raised to power minus 12 coulomb square divided by what uh newton meter square that is the unit are we together now why what the value for k is what nine times 10 raised to power nine newton meter square per coulomb square now this can only be used this value of k would be used if those two charges are static in what in vacuum or in air what if those two charges are static in water what if they are static in paraffin how can you calculate that we still using what this the answer to that is what no there is something we call the relative permittivity okay so if i have this now i have that permittivity of a medium the permittivity of a medium is equal to the permittivity of vacuum relative permittivity so we have what a the permittivity of any medium is equal to permittivity of vacuum times relative permittivity that is in the question if that particular two charge are in another medium they will give you the relative permittivity of that medium so you multiply it with what the permittivity of vacuum then you get the what the permittivity of that particular medium are you getting it now then you can now slot it into the equation that k is equals to one all over what four pi now instead of epsilon naught now is going to be what epsilon naught times epsilon what r which is relative what permittivity that is permittivity of vacuum times this so k is equal to one all over four pi epsilon what m that is the permittivity of that medium whatever value you have here is what you are going to use for k but the formula that is the units for k remain the same coulomb square per Newton meter square, sorry, Newton meter square per Coulomb square. Per Coulomb square. So, do we understand this now? Okay, if yes, let us take some questions on this. Question number one. Number one now. We are asked to calculate the electrostatic force between two electrons separated by a distance of 10 raised to power minus 10 meter. If the charge of one electron is negative 1.6 times 10 raised to power minus 19 coulomb. Remember, the negative there is not affecting the magnitude, but telling us that electron is negatively charged. So what's the solution to this? so is the force going to be a force of attraction or a force of repulsion okay good that is going to be what a force of repulsion because the two charges are of the same charge so we have that f is equal to kq1 q2 over r squared so we have our k to be 
9 times 10 raised to power 9, then multiply by 1.6 times 10 raised to power minus 19, times 1.6 times 10 raised to power minus 19, divided by 10 raised to power minus 10 squared. So are we there now? Okay, if that should be the case, we can now see 9 times 1.6 times 1.6. 9 times 1.6 times 1.6. Then multiply by 10 raised to power of 9. Then minus 19 minus 19. Divided by 10 raised to power minus 20. So that is this 2 will multiply this. Then it becomes this. Are we together? So if that should be the case, what will be our answer? Okay, so we have that F which is the force of, a, force of repulsion between the two charges, is going to be 9 times 1.6 times 1.6. So that gives us 23.04. 23.04 times 10 raised to power 9 minus 19 minus 19. 9 minus 19 minus 19. That will give us minus 29. Divided by 10 raised to power minus 20. So F is 23.04 times 10 raised to power minus 29 plus 20. Thus, this is going to give us 2.3, sorry, 23.04 times 10 raised to power minus 9 Newton. So here is the value of what? Of the force of repulsion between the two charges. Okay, I can write it as F equal to 3.04 nano Newton. So this is the value for the force of repulsion. In what direction does this take place? Okay, so we don't know because of what? Because it's a force of repulsion. So this takes place in what? In the negative direction. Are we together now? Okay, so let's look at the next one now. So here is question three, question two rather. Find the force on the center charge in the figure shown below. So this is the figure. We are asked to look for the force on this center charge, that is charge Q2. How can we go about that? Remember, this is a positive charge. This is a negative charge. And this is also a, a positive charge. So this positive charge Q1 is said to have force of attraction on Q2 and that is why you see that the force of attraction is moving towards this side and though when you look at what Q3 also is going to have what a force of attraction on Q2 dragging it towards that side are we getting it now so it means that we are having two what two forces of attraction acting on this center mass but what is going to be the net force acting on this center charge are we together now? Okay, before we go on, note that two nanocolumn is not what? It's not the appropriate unit for charge. Charge is measured in coulomb. This one also, nanocolumn. This one also, nanocolumn. So it means you have to what? Convert everything to coulomb. One nanocolumn is equivalent to one, is equivalent to one times 10 raised to power minus nine coulomb. So let's know that. So if that should be the case, let's calculate for this first, F1. So for us to calculate for F1, we have K equal what? Q1, Q2, all over what? R square. Where this R is what? 4 meter. So we have 9 times 10 raised to power 9. Then multiply by Q1 is 2 nano coulomb. That is 2 times 10 raised to power minus 9. Then multiply by, this one is 4 nano coulomb. That will be 4 times 10 to power of minus 9. Are we together? Divided by the distance between them, that is 4 square. Are we together? So, 9 times 2 times 4, that will give us what? 72. Abi? Okay, because 9 times 2 is 18. 18 times 4, 72. So, this is going to be multiplied by 9 minus 9 minus what? 9. And this will give divided by what? Divided by 16. So, let's quickly punch our calculator to see what we are going to have. Okay, so 72 divided by 16. So, we have 4.5. So, this will give us 4.5 times 10 raised to power minus 9. Because 
this and this will cancel, then we'll have minus 9. So this is going to be in Newton. So that's not all. Because this one also is exerting a force on this. So let's calculate that force F2 also. So force F2 is going to be KQ2 and what? Q3 over R squared. Are we together? So this equal what? This equal 9 times 10 raised to power 9 multiply by 4 times 10 raised to power minus 9 then multiply by 8 times 10 raised to power minus 9 divided by what? The distance between this and this is just what? 2 and that will be 2 squared. Are we together? So what will be our result? Okay. 9 times 4 times 8 that will give us 288. So 288 times 10 raised to power minus 9 divided by 4. So F2, F2 is going to be 288 divided by 4. So we have 72 times 10 raised to power minus 9 Newton. Are we together? Okay. So we are running out of space. Let me clear this. Okay, if that should be the case now. We see that F1 is 4.5 times 10 to the power of minus 9 Newton. And the F2 is 72 times 10 raised to the power of uh, minus 9 Newton. So watch the net force on Q, on Q2, are we together? Because they are acting in opposite direction. Is going to be F2 minus what? F1. Supposing that they are acting in the same direction, it's going to be plus. Remember, this net force is what? A vector quantity. So direction needs to be considered. So we just have that 72 minus 4.5 multiplied by 10 raised to power minus 9. So what do we have? 72 minus 4.5, that will give us 67. 0.5 times 10 raised to power minus 9 Newton or we can simply write it as we can simply write it as F of Q3 of Q2 rather is going to be 67.5 nano Newton so this is going to be the magnitude of the force but what is now the direction of the force? If you watch, you will see that the force F2 is greater than what? F1. Because F2 is greater than F1, then it means the body move towards what? The right hand side. The direction of this force is towards the right hand side. Another thing that can make you know the direction is the answer here is positive. So since it is positive, and we know that towards the left is negative X, and towards the right is positive what? X. So because the result is positive, it shows that it moves to the positive X angle. So let's look at the third example. Third example. So here is question three. The question three states, three point charges are placed along a straight line as shown. Determine the net electrostatic force that point charge Q1 feels due to the other two. So, it's just similar to the previous question. We are looking for the electrostatic force that this point charge Q1 experienced as a result of Q2 and what? Q3. Now, if this is negative and this is also negative, between Q2 and Q1 is going to be force of what? Repulsion. And this is positive. Q3 is said to do what? To attract what? Q1. How we together? So let's quickly look at that. So I'll say, let F1 be the force of repulsion between these two. And I'll say F2 to be the force of attraction between what? This and this. Are we together? Okay. So this is going to be F2. Okay, let me write it. F13. I write this one as F12. Correct. So F12 is going to be K Q1 Q2 divided by what? R squared. So that will give us micro coulomb is not the same thing as coulomb. So you have to convert to what? Coulomb by multiplying by what? 10 raised to power minus 6. 
because one micro coulomb is equivalent to what one times 10 raised to power minus six coulomb gets clear correct so it's going to be what nine times 10 raised to power nine then because k is this so uh, times what q1 which is uh two times 10 raised to power minus six then times q3 which is six times 10 raised to power minus six divided by the distance between q1 and q2 is what three so we have three squared and this in terms equal what? 9 times 2 times 6, what do we have? Okay, 9 times 2 times 3. So that's 54. So we have 54 times 10 raised to power minus 6 minus 6, that will give us minus 12 plus 9, that's minus 3, divided by what? Divided by 9. So 54 divided by 9. 54 divided by 9. So that should give us 6. So we have F12 to equal what? 6 times 10 raised to the power of minus 3 Newton. So do we get this now? So let's calculate for what? F13 also. So F13 is going to be what? KQ1. Q3 over R square. So that's 9 times 9 times Q1 is 2 times 10 raised to power minus 6. Then times Q3, that's 12 times 10 raised to power minus 6 divided by the distance between them. Now, from here to this place is 3. Then from here to this place is what? 5. So the total distance between Q3 and Q1 is what? 8. That is, you have these two together. So we have 8 square. So, F13 is going to be 9 times 2, 9 times 2 times 12, that's 216, multiplied by 10 raised to power minus 3, divided by 64. So, 216 divided by 64, we have 3.375, are we together? So, this 3.375 new thing, okay? This is we multiply by 10 raised to power minus 3 in Newton. Okay, so what's going to be the net force now? So we have to take a difference. Okay, obviously this is greater than, that is F12 is greater than F13. So if that should be the case, the net force is going to be, the net force on Q1 is going to be F12 minus F13. And that will give us what? 6 times 10 raised to power minus 3. The minus what? F13, that is 3.375 times 10 raised to power minus 3. So this will give us what? 6 minus 3.375. That will give us 2.625 times 10 raised to power minus 3 Newton. So, this is the force on Q1. So, what will be the direction, guys? Remember, F12 is greater than F13. And what? F12 is a force of repulsion. And the force of repulsion, it shows that what? It repel. This is Q. If you look at the diagram again, this is Q2. And this is what? Q1. So, if Q2 tends to do what? Attract this. If Q1 attracts Q2, it's going to come in this direction, Abby. And what? If Q2 should attract what? Q1 is going in this what? Direction. But because what? They repel each other. It shows that what? It moves to the negative axis. Are we together now? Oh, sorry. This is still us what? The negative. Correct. Okay. Shall we go on now? So that's just about the direction. So let's look at what example four. Okay, guys, here is where we are going to stop. But before we go, I would like you to take example four and five as assignment. Try it on your own. Determine the net electrostatic force on point charge Q2 as a result of the other two charges. Assume that all charges are stationary. 
don't get it twisted. When I say assume that all charges are stationary, it's just to assure you that you are dealing with what a stationary charge. Remember, a stationary charge is the only charge that can obey what Coulomb's law, like I said. So here is the diagram. So question two says three point charges are located at the corners of an equilateral triangle with side of length two meter. If Q1 is positive 6.0 microcolor and q2 is negative 12.0 microcolor and q3 is negative 5.0 microcolor calculate the net electrostatic force on point charge q3 assume charges are stationary thank you we'll meet in the next class where we are going to continue from electric field good day